Welcome everyone to the webinar for June on 802.11 Frame Analysis. My name is Tom Carpenter. I'm the CTO at CWNP. You can find me on Twitter at CarpenterTom. And of course, we are on Twitter at CWNP. If you want to tweet anything during the webinar, just hashtag it CWNP webinar. And you can also tag both myself and CWNP in it if you like. Today's topic is, of course, frame analysis in 802.11. We're going to start from the beginning as we go through this process and understand some terminology and things like that. But we'll look at the agenda momentarily. First of all, what I'd like to do is take a quick look at some news. First of all, the Wi-Fi Trek registration is still available at conferences.cwnp.com. Call for speakers is closed and the selection process has started. So we're in the process now of choosing the speakers. You do have 122 days remaining, so it's getting closer and closer. Also, additionally, there is a discount for webinar attendees and friends. If you want to pass it on, that's fine. This is the coupon for the June webinar, and it only applies to any CWS or CWT product. So maybe you're already a CWNA or even professional level certified, maybe even a CWNE, but you've got some friends that need to get started learning about wireless in more detail. You can give them this code. It'll give them a 20% discount on anything they want in the store related to CWS or CWT. And it's good through the end of the day tomorrow, June 15th. So take advantage of it yourself or pass it on to some friends that might want to take advantage of it. Again, the coupon code is June Webinar, and it's a 20% discount on any of the products you see in the store for CWS or CWT. Well, with that, let's take a look at the agenda. So first of all, we're going to talk about, as I said, terminology. So I want to make sure we understand the terms in and around 802.11 frame analysis. And you'll notice I'm not saying protocol analysis necessarily, I'm saying frame analysis because we do want to focus today on the frames, that layer two level. And we'll talk more about that as well. Then we'll talk about the different protocol analyzers that are available and the features and capabilities that we offer. And then we'll discuss troubleshooting. So how does all of this apply to trying to resolve the various problems that may occur in our network? So with that said, let's cover the terminology. First of all, we have the term bit, which probably most of you know means a one or a zero. It is a bit is a value that can be equal to one or a zero. So one bit can be on or off, right? If it's on, it's a one. If it's off, it's a zero. When we put multiple bits together, we have what is called a byte. But many of the standard documents, including IEEE and IETF for RFCs, will use the term octet because it's more accurate than the term byte. So byte, a lot of people don't realize, is a general term. There's this assumption that a byte is 8 bits. Well, an octet byte is 8 bits, but a byte could be 7, it could be 4, it could be 9. It's a byte of bits. It's a chunk of bits, right? <laughs> and so the reality is that a byte may not be 8 bits, but an octet is specifically and always 8 bits. And that's why you'll see that term octet used very heavily within the standards documents because it's defining an 8-bit byte. Okay. Now, we also have this concept of the OSI model layers. And the OSI model is a reference model that we can use to think about the way networks work. And so we look at each layer of communications that happen to provide connections between devices. So we have layer one, the physical layer, all the way through to layer seven, the application layer. Wi-Fi operates at layer one and layer two. So layer two is where 802.11 frames are created. And then the layer one area is where we do some headers for the physical layer and then actually transmit the bits, the ones and the zeros going out as radio frequency waves. So layer one, physical layer, layer two is the data link layer, but we're most concerned with a sub layer in the data link layer called the Mac sub layer, which is where your 802.11 framing takes place. Of course, layer three is generally IP in modern networks today. And layer four is generally TCP or UDP. And then layers five through seven are your application, encoding, session handling, things like that. So for most cases, when you're troubleshooting, 
you're focused on layer four and below from the network perspective, but it is important to know the types of applications in some cases because applications have different demands that they place on the network, but ultimately they still become some kind of a TCP or UDP payload that needs to be delivered on that network. Now the term payload, we usually refer to it as the IP data, the upper layer data. But technically speaking, the payload that comes down to layer three is TCP or UDP data. And then the payload that comes down to layer two is IP data, right? So when we talk about the payload, it's just what we need to deliver from the layers above. So for 802.11 frames, the payload is the IP data that needs to go to some destination, either on our network or on a different network somewhere in the world. A frame then is an organized collection of prepended and appended bits or bytes. So you take the payload, you put a bunch of bits in front of it, you put a bunch of bits behind it, and that frames it. It encapsulates it. It puts a frame around it, right? So this is where this term frame comes from. We're framing the payload with the information that's needed, the layer in question, layer two in this case, to get it to another layer two, virtual device or logical device on the network. And then when we grab a whole bunch of these frames off of the network and put them all together, we create what's called a capture or a trace file. A capture or trace is simply multiple frames or packets from a capture session. And so these are the terms that you'll hear used in and around 802.11 frame analysis or even Ethernet frame analysis or whatever it happens to be, IP packet analysis. You're still going to see a lot of these same terms. So for example, you might say that the first bit in a particular portion of the header represents X. It represents a certain thing, right? So you might say that a particular portion of the header is eight bytes or it's 16 bytes or it is one byte. The point is that it tells you something when you understand the terminology that is behind it. And for most network communications, if you see the term byte used, it's eight bits. OK, so it means the same thing as an octet. All right, so let's talk about frames in more detail. Keep in mind that when we're dealing with different network devices, we have layer one, two, and three devices that are used to get stuff through the network. Yes, there can be higher layer devices. You might have an application layer firewall or an application layer router or even an application layer switch, right? A multi-layer switch. So the point is that you might have those, but let's keep it at the simple layer of, of discussion and say when we're talking about a switch, we're talking about a layer two device, particularly when it's an ethernet switch, right? That's a layer two device. It may do something in addition to being an ethernet switch, but as an ethernet switch, it's a layer two device. And then when we have a router, that's a layer three device. Okay. So this is an IP router for most of our internal networks today. So you see the router represented here with two ports, one to connect to one network, one to connect to another. You see the switch is represented here with four ports just because it's the same size as the router and four ports fit in there when I was putting the graphics together. So we can see that. Uh, you see the cloud in the upper right. This is kind of the internet, right? It's a layer three network where we're just moving things around based on IP addresses. Routers move things around based on IP addresses. Switches move things around based on layer two MAC addresses. And then, of course, between your wireless device and your access point, you have layer two communications, 802.11 frames. Now, the payload is, is an IP data packet, maybe, but it may not be, right? Because it may be a communication just between a laptop or a mobile phone and the access point. Then it's strictly a layer two communication with no upper layer data. But your phone and your laptop are layer seven devices, right? They are intended to take data all the way from layer one, bring it up to layer seven and pass it on to the email application, the web browser, whatever it happens to be, or to take stuff from the email application, pass it all the way down to layer one and send it out on the network. Okay. Now, when I say that something's a layer seven, a layer two, a layer three device, what I mean is its primary function is to decapsulate what it receives up to that layer and then do something with it. 
So all higher layer devices must, by requirement, be lower layer devices as well. So a layer 3 router is also a layer 2 device. It has to receive an Ethernet frame, or it has to receive some other frame type in order to decapsulate the IP packet and then forward that onto the proper destination. A layer 2 switch, by nature, is also a layer 1 Ethernet device. A layer 2 access point is not just a layer 2 Mac framing device, it's also a Phi or physical layer device with the ability to transmit and receive radio frequency waves or signals. Okay, so understand that when we talk about something being, being a layer X device, we mean that in that function, the function of IP routing, in that function, the function of Ethernet switching, it decapsulates up to layer two or layer three and then makes its decision and then re encapsulates, right, and sends it off to whatever destination it needs to go to. So when we look at an 802.11 frame specifically, we see here at the bottom the actual frame format from the 802.11 standard. And you can see that it has a frame control section. Notice it's two octets. So we learned an octet is an 8-bit byte, right? So two means 16 bits. There's a duration ID value. It's two octets, so 16 bits. There's an address 1, 2, 3, and 4 field that is either 6 or nothing or 6, right? Uh, so if you take 6 times 8, what do you get? 48 bits. Interesting. If you've ever thought about the size of a MAC address, ah, 40. Okay, so we can see why that's set that way. Sequence control can be either nothing or 16 bits. Quality of service control is either nothing or 16 bits. And HT control is either nothing or 32 bits. And then finally, we append at the very end after the payload, the frame check sequence, which you'll notice here is four octets or 32 bits. Now, the frame check sequence is used to validate the preceding portion of the frame to make sure it was received without corruption. Okay, so that's why that's there. And it's also appended, it's at the end. So think of this frame as being transmitted from left to right. So the first wave, if you will, that I'm going to send out is going to represent whatever number of bits it can of the frame control field. And then the rest of the frame control bits in the next wave and the rest in the next wave and then the duration ID in the next wave. So I'm being simple here saying waves, but the point is that our symbols represent this information, right? And we're going to send it starting with the frame control field, then the duration ID, then the address one. And if it's there, address two, address three, then sequence control if it's there and so forth. So the frame check sequence is the last thing that is transmitted. Now, let me state something very clearly. All of these frames are just a bunch of ones and zeros. It might seem overwhelming at first, but you can go to the 802.11 standard and go into more detail than I have time to get into today, but you can download the 802.11 2016 standard, for example, and you can go in and see, okay, the frame control field, what are those 16 bits divided into? And what, what does each individual bit represent? Okay, so for example, there's a frame in there, a, a, rather a bit in there related to power management. All right, so what does that bit represent? And once you know, you know, zero, one, what does it do? You can read about it in the standard and just take it bit by bit. And it's not as big of a deal. It's kind of like eating broccoli when you're a kid, right? So when you're young and your parents make you eat broccoli, it's kind of the thing where you just have to take the first bit. I mean, bite. You, you get what I mean. But the point is, take it bit by bit, and you can understand what these things do. You don't have to be overwhelmed by it. Make sure you understand the meaning of those bits, what they represent, and then you can gather that information and understand it in great detail. Now, by the way, before we leave this slide, there's one more section, the payload, which notice is called the frame body, over to the right in the 802.11 frame. It's called the frame body. That's what we're calling the payload. And notice it's just stated in the newest versions of the standard as variable length. So at one point it was from zero to this, and then they changed the standard, and then it was zero to this, and they changed it again, and it was zero to this. So rather than that, they just said it's variable. Okay. But then it does define in the standard, depending on various scenarios, are we using frame aggregation, etc., what that actual length can be. So it's a variable length depending on the upper layer payload, right? What do I need 
to send. So I don't need a 2000 bit frame body if my payload is only 43 bits, right? So therefore it's a variable length field. Now, what we use to capture these frames is a protocol analyzer. And this is where it gets very, very important with 802.11. On the left, we see Air Magnet Wi-Fi Analyzer. On the right, we see a dashboard from OmniPeak, which is used for wireless line analysis. And in the middle, we see ComView for Wi-Fi. These are the three most well-known protocol analyzers that are designed for 802.11 frame capture and analysis. The reason I emphasize that is if you don't have a tool that can capture 802.11 frames, and there are others as well, but if you don't have a tool that can capture them, then you're not going to see the 802.11 frames. For example, you might be connected to a wireless network using your laptop, and then you run Wireshark on Windows, and you do a capture of your network traffic. Well, unless you have the right adapter, and there are very few that work with Wireshark directly on Windows, you're only going to really see IP data and up, only data that's destined to you or going from you, and you're going to get a fake Ethernet header put on it. It's not Ethernet, it's Wi-Fi, but that's what Wireshark's going to do to you. So you got to have a tool that has the right drivers, and then you have to have the right adapter to work with that tool so that you can actually capture this. So if you go to any of these websites, uh, Tamosoft with ComView for Wi-Fi has historically had the widest support for various different adapters for capture. It doesn't necessarily have as powerful of a dashboard engine as what Air Magnet has or OmniPeak has, but it has a wider support for adapters than either of those has typically had in the past. And so you can get the right USB adapter and then you can perform your capture. You can go to the Tamosoft website, you can go to the NetScout website, you can go to the Savias website, and you can find out what adapters are supported by the application of your choice and then get those adapters to capture. Now you can also capture wireless traffic in Linux using Wireshark. Again, you still need the right adapter, but you can capture in Linux using that. Of course, as you may or may not know on the Mac, Wireshark captures just beautifully with a built-in adapter. So if you've got a Mac with a 3x3 11AC chipset in it, then you can just install Wireshark and off you go being able to capture. There are also excellent add-on tools created by Adrian Granados that allow you to simplify the capture process. And you can even get Wi-Fi Explorer Pro and do some capture built right into it as well. So this is just an overview of the different protocol analyzers that are available on the market. The types of protocol analyzers vary. So the three that we looked at on the previous slide were actually all portable mobile laptop based, right? Um, and, and mobile protocol analyzers are good, but sometimes you want to have either infrastructure or distributed. With infrastructure, it means that I'm capturing from my access points. Now, the downside is if my APs have only one radio, I have to take it offline as an AP to do the protocol capture, at least for some period of time. If they have two radios, I might be able to use one of them for capture while the other one is serving clients. Then with the distributed, uh, the basic concept is, is I'm putting sensors out in my network that can capture all of these and they're bringing them back to a centralized location. So the three basic types of protocol analyzers, mobile, infrastructure, and distributed. And you'll need to use what you can use. Now keep in mind with infrastructure and distributed both, there's a big constraint they have. The benefit is obviously I can capture from all over the place, right? But the constraint is I can only capture from the point of view of the AP or sensor. In other words, where those things are located. And it's not like I can put another sensor every two feet, right? Or put an AP every two feet. Well, I mean, I could, but it would increase the cost of my deployment by millions of dollars. So I, I really can't do that. And that's why mobile analysis, at least today, is still very beneficial because I can go specifically to where the client might be located that's having a problem and see what things look like from that specific location. Now let's just take a look at a few frames. Now these are obviously not the frames actually shown as a wave form of the symbol and they are not the ones and zeros, but this is what a protocol analyzer does for me. It does something called frame decoding 
or packet decoding if you're looking at a higher layer. And so what that means is, is it takes those ones and zeros and it interprets them for me into English statements that I might understand. Okay, so you'll notice over here on the left for the beacon frame, the first thing is wireless packet info. All right, this is something that is either passed up through the driver to the protocol analyzer or is a best guess from the protocol analyzer using some types of internal algorithms. But basically it's telling me things like the signal strength, the uh, signal level, the noise level, the data rate that it's sent at. This is one megabits per second. So I'm going to pause for one moment and I'm going to give you a chance to think about it. You don't have to type in your answer. I just want you to think about this. If a beacon frame is sent at one megabit per second, what frequency band am I in? Now the answer is on the screen, but I want you to think about it. Yeah, you're in 2.4 gigahertz, aren't you? Because there is no one megabits per second data rate in five gigahertz. The lowest data rate in five gigahertz is six megabits per second with 802.11a or OFDM. And so we're definitely at 2.4 gigahertz when we see that one megabit per second. Of course, a couple down, it tells us that, right? We can see we're on channel four. Oh, isn't that lovely? Uh, 2427 megahertz or 2.427 gigahertz. We can see the frame size is 308 bytes. And then we get into the actual 802.11. Notice the first thing there, you have a frame control section, okay? And you see the duration value, the destination address, the source address, uh, the BSS ID, there's a fragment number and a sequence number. Uh, so that's up in that upper layer information, right? The frame control and then the address one, two, three, and four, what have you. And then the sequence numbers there. And then notice we get into what this frame is actually about. It's a beacon frame. So because it's a beacon frame, I see the beacon interval. Now it's important to know that this thing called the beacon interval is a target interval. Okay, it's a target, target beacon interval. It is not fixed where it's guaranteed to go out at that time. When the AP wants to send a beacon frame, which announces to the world, hey, here's the network, among other things. When it wants to send out a beacon frame, it has to contend for access to the RF medium, the channel, just like anybody else does, right? So because of that, you can see that it's going to target 102.4 milliseconds. Okay, so that's the fixed actual number. It's the default that all the devices will use unless you change it. So what that means is a little less than 10 times a second it's going to send out a beacon frame. Now, if you think about that, it's a 308 byte frame. If I had 10 APs, I'm sorry, 10 SSIDs on this AP for some reason, then that's 3,080 bytes sent out every second. 3,080 bytes sent out every second. But wait a minute, it's 3,080 bytes times 10, right? So it's 30,800 bytes that I've got to send every second just for beacon frames. This is why you don't want to have too many SSIDs. We usually recommend keeping them at three or fewer, maxing out at four or five if you absolutely have to. But you want to keep them as low as possible. You'll notice the SSID is JNT24. And look at the current channel. Wait a minute, it's channel six. Hold on, over there it told me it was channel four. But here's channel six. How is that possible? Well... Here's the thing to keep in mind. That wireless packet info is not always right. So what we see on the left under wireless packet info could be simply an error of the best guess of the protocol analyzer. It could be that I captured on channel four, but look at that signal strength, neg 21. It could be that I'm capturing on channel four, but I'm actually picking up the beacon frame and able to decode it and everything because I'm so close to the transmission so that I can actually pick that up. So uh, that's a possibility, but the only way you can really know is to know when you captured this, what channel you were capturing on. I happen to know this was coming from a scan, and so it probably did capture on channel four and pick up the beacon frame. Uh, you can see security settings in here. That's called the RSN information element and so forth. So this is what a beacon frame looks like. Here's an authentication frame. I won't spend as much time on it, but you're going to see in the request for authentication, this is standard 802.11 authentication. It's not WPA personal or WPA enterprise, or WPA2 or what have you. This is just an authentication frame to gain access to the AP. So 
the thing we send it to is the AP. So the receiver address is the AP MAC address. The transmitter address is the station MAC address. Then when the authentication grant goes out, so the authentication frame goes back to the client, notice the receiver is now the station, what was the source, and the source is now the AP, what was the receiver. Okay, so it's just in reverse going back to that station. And then here we see association frames. So we see again, the Apple is the source, the Netgear AP is the receiver, and then for the association response frame, we see the source is now Netgear, and the receiver is the Apple client. So this is simply authentication and association. Standard 802.11 open system authentication and association. Here's an acknowledgement frame. One of the common frames that you'll see on the left is a standard acknowledgement frame. On the right is a block acknowledgement frame. Okay, so I just want to give you a few example frames so you could see what some of these frames might look like. Now let's talk about a very important thing and that's the process that we go through then when it comes to protocol analysis. Following a defined process is going to optimize the troubleshooting task and it'll provide a more consistent set of results from problem to problem. So a good process to use, of course, it all starts with a problem, right? <laughs> we have a user that's experiencing some pain point. So they call you or they call the help desk and the report comes in. The first thing you need to do is select the right tool. So depending on the problem, a protocol analyzer may or may not be the tool. It may be a spectrum analyzer that you want to use, okay? Or maybe some other diagnostics tool that you have available in your organization. Or maybe you determine, okay, it's a protocol analyzer. So I've got my tool of the protocol analyzer. Next, I needed to figure out at what location do I need to actually capture the communications so that I can troubleshoot them. The location might be near the client. It might be near the AP. And to determine whether you're going to be by the client or by the AP, think about this. Do you have only one client experiencing the problem? No other problem reports are out there. Everybody's just fine. Then you'll probably end up capturing near the client. So you can make sure you capture everything that client's transmitting and receiving. Um, if the problem is multiple clients, then you might decide to capture closer to the AP. Now those are general guidelines and you'll learn more and more as you go along. Expertise comes through experience of working with the technology. Once you've chosen the application, you can actually perform the capture. How long am I going to capture? 60 seconds? 10 minutes? 30 minutes? It's going to vary by problem. If it's an intermittent problem that only occurs once every 5 or 10 minutes, you'll probably have to capture for 7 to 10 minutes in order to actually capture the frames when the problem occurs. So that can be very important. And some protocol analyzers give you the ability to flag during your capture. So if you're sitting there by the user, they're using it, you're capturing, and then the problem occurs, you can flag it, indicating that it, around that time is when it happened, so you know where to go in your capture. Once you have your capture, you go back to your workstation, or maybe you'll just do it right there, but you go back and analyze that capture to try to resolve the problem. So this is a basic flow that you go through. Of great importance is tool selection, right tool for the right job. Okay, so if you suspect there's an RF interference source that's not Wi-Fi, then you probably want a spectrum analyzer. If you suspect faulty drivers and you want to know how they're communicating, you need a protocol analyzer. Then the location is wildly important. And then the actual capture is important. So you want to capture either on a specific channel. Do you want to scan multiple channels? If it's a general performance problem, you might want to do a scan from a location across multiple channels to see what's going on on all the different channels. So those three steps before the analysis are so important because if you don't have the right information to analyze, you can't analyze it to resolve the problem. So let's talk about some common problems that are solved with analysis. Driver problems. This is something you see a lot. So you may see, for example, super large duration values in frames that are sent out. And you wonder why your performance is so bad. But every time one or more of a device type communicates, they may be setting the duration value too high in the frame header. And what that does is it tells all the other devices in the channel, <laughs> you got to be quiet for that length of time. 
even if it didn't need that amount of time to communicate. So a bug in the driver, and these have been seen. This is why I'm using it as an example. These have been seen in live environments. And sometimes you can fix the problem by updating firmware, uh, updating the drivers, what have you. Uh, connectivity problems. Devices are unable to connect to the system. And so you can analyze those problems and figure out what's going on. Is this an interference issue? Is this a configuration problem? So for example, maybe certain data rates are disabled on the AP. So the client can see the AP. It shows up in the list of SSIDs, right? It can see it, but it can't connect to it because it doesn't have enough signal strength to support the required minimum data rate, right? So those kind of things can be discovered. Uh, CCI issues with the right tool. So if you're wanting to know how many different APs are seen from a particular location or how many client stations are seen from a particular location, when you do your capture in the tool, you'll be able to see, okay, on channel six, how many different devices did I see communicating and what BSSs are they a part of? So you could actually then begin to figure out if maybe there is a CCI problem. And remember, CCI is uh, co-channel interference. It's what occurs naturally where a station has to wait and be silent and can't communicate because it's waiting on other stations to finish their communications on the network. You can locate configuration errors. Uh, so you can quickly look at beacon frames and see the settings from the AP and maybe figure out some wireless LAN profile setting configuration problem that needs fixed. Um, some protocol analyzers allow you to set alerts. So you can say, hey, if I see an AP that does not support six megabits per second, I want you to fire alert because maybe we want to require that that be supported everywhere in 2.4 gigahertz, in, in five gigahertz, what have you. So we'll disable one and two, maybe even 5.5 and 11, because we don't want any 11B devices connecting to the network, let's say. But we want six to be enabled everywhere for some reason in our configuration. So we can have an alert that fires off and tells us about that. Uh, you can look at security settings. And so again, good tools can give you reports on any device that breaches some policy you set up. Like alert me if there's any AP out there that's still running WPA, which is TKIP RC4, right? On a BSS. And then just general performance problems. So you can do a capture. You can look at the kinds of communications that are happening. You can understand what stations are talking the most. And this kind of thing can help you resolve various general performance problems. Now, that's the scheduled content that we have. But let me point out that on YouTube, on the CWNP TV YouTube channel, there are a couple of pre-existing related past webinars you might want to look at in addition to the information we've shared today. There's one a little more recent, uh, 802.11ac frames, what's changed? Well, that's actually a couple years old now, but it still gives you an overview of the changes that came with 802.11ac. And then there's a, a good webinar on little known wireless and wired analysis tools, which introduces you to some of the different tools that are available to you. Of course, we're in the middle right now of updating our CWAP certification. And so you're going to see learning materials come out for CWAP in September of this year, including e-learning, study guides, brand new courseware for our training centers, practice tests, and so forth. And all of that is going to be really valuable information for you to take your knowledge even deeper into frame analysis than we have time to in a presentation like this. I will be doing a webinar later on in the year, which is 100% demo. So we'll just be doing demonstrations in a protocol analyzer of looking at different kinds of captures and what we can learn from those. So watch for that announcement in the future as well. Well, that is the end of our scheduled content.